Okay, everyone, welcome to the fifth Oscope Geochemistry Network webinar. Now, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. In my case, here at Curtin University, they are the Wadjuk people. Our presentation today will feature researchers from the Australian National University, and they acknowledge the traditional owners there as the Ngambri and Ngunawal people. Collectively, we recognize their continuing connection to the land, waters, and culture, and pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I'm Alexander Prent, coordinator of the OSCO Geochemistry Network, and today I'll start with an update on the AGM before introducing the main talk of this webinar. Now, the AGN was set up in order to address a community expressed need for greater coordination and collaboration between geochemistry laboratories in Australia. And the main goal of the AGN is to create a national collaborative network of these laboratories. And this will help facilitate to achieve national geoscience endeavors, such as the Isotopic Atlas of Australia. Here in the left corner, an example of how that can be overlaid. A very powerful tool. Now, the AGN is supported by OSCOPE through the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. And we have an AGN project team that consists of researchers, technical laboratory staff, and data scientists from currently Macquarie University, the University of Melbourne, and Curtin University. We, re we receive great support from the OSCO headquarters, from Tim, Tanya, and Joe, and we work closely together with the Lithodep team to develop our data repository, OSGeochem, and that is with Fabian, Wayne, and Moritz. Now, I should not forget to mention that we have support from multiple people from multiple laboratories across Australia in the expert advisory groups from the Fission Track and Helium, the Argon Argon community, the Hafnium Uranium Lead Laser community, the Metal Isotope group, and the Uranium Lead Shrimp community. Now, the main aim of the AGN, I've already mentioned, to create a national network of laboratories is besides the objectives to create this repository in the form of OSGEOCAM, which follows the FAIR principles and open data initiatives, then further the AGM promotes investment in geochemistry capability, professional development and user access, and we're also preserving legacy data sets and samples. So quite proud to announce that we have this um, OSGEOCAM alpha test release in uh, on 20 December, in which we, the AGN team, will be able to test the databasing, streamline upload, just and minting, a bit of statistical toolbox, and that will serve to develop the rest of those uh, tools underneath there. And especially the alpha testing will include the shrimp data model and user interface, IGSN batch minting and sample functionality, which serves as a sample registry functionality, and road testing of a upload tool, the ETL batch upload tool. So that's with our focus for the last best part of this year. Then for the last six weeks, we've also heard from the ARDC funding proposals that were unfortunately unsuccessful, but we will submit a AGN plus proposal to grow the network to the Oscope headquarters in early 2021. Now we've had chats with EarthCam and EPOS. Well, chats we had quite a discussion to collaborate on the uh, lithologies and the hierarchies thereof, a vocabulary ontology, and then from that followed a conversation with Mindet.org that want to collaborate on the development thereof. Now, upcoming conference presentations are a uh, presentation tomorrow morning at AGU by myself. Samuel Boone will present 
a presentation during Thermo 2020 next week, Wednesday, on big data in the low temperature thermochronology. And next year, Hayden Dalton and Samuel Boone will present the AGN and OSGEO CAM during the ESC. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Marnie Forster, who will present us more about the National Argon Map Project, how that's set up, and how that is already a uh, big part of the Isotopic Atlas of Australia. So, thank you, and I'll give the floor to Marnie. Um. I appreciate um, being given this opportunity to talk about the National Line on Map. So I just want to thank Brent and Alex for um, making this happen. And I want to thank the people that are attending for um, coming along and having a look at the National Line on Map. I'm, I'm told that it's quite a diverse audience. And so I've put together different aspects of the National Line on Map so that um, potentially I can, um, you know, help the different types of people that are here see what they see. So the NAM, as we call it, um, is an OSCO pilot project supported by the OSCO Opportunity Fund. And yeah, so the NAM team, which is me as the ANU project leader, Jeff Fraser is the GA chair of the oversight panel and Davud Vasesh is the ANU IT support. We're a team which has now worked together for quite a number of years. We know each other really well and we work really well together as a team. We we tend to have um, lots of meeting together with the three of us and even though we're classified as holding these roles, we all participate in all sorts of ways to get this um, NAM running. We also are fortunate now that we have an oversight panel and um, we um, collaborate with the National Argonne Network and I'll talk about this shortly. First of all, the oversight panel. I mean, I, I'm just can't say enough about this panel. They're just really high quality scientists. They've got great expertise and a really um, a good oversight to be able to do this job. We have Jeff as the chair, who's the director of the Geomonology and Stratigraphy in the Mineral Systems Branch at GA. We have Catherine Spagliari, who's a geologist geophysicist, recently retired from GSWA. Professor Dave Giles, and I mean, I know Dave is the chief scientist from MINEX CRC. And we have a laureate fellow from Curtin Uni, Professor Xiang Xiang Li, and Peter Ray from industry, who's the exploration scientist at Glencore in Mount Isa, and Anthony Reid, who's a senior principal geologist at the Geological Survey of South Australia. These people have actually given quite a lot of time to their, their role here. Um, they, they're they're um, very enthusiastic and they take the role really seriously and they, they review all of the proposals that have come in um, in detail, making comments and suggestions to improve them. And considering that we've got quite a number of proposals in, you can see they've done quite a lot of work. The National Argon Network, which is the four Australian laboratories, um, we've got Fred Jordan at Curtin University, Dave Phillips at Melbourne Uni, um, Paolo Vasconcelos at Uni Queensland, and myself at ANU. Um, and I'll talk more about them a little bit later on, but they're a key role in the, in the proposal. The participants um, are also very important, and I've listed them here in institutions. But each of these institutions potentially um, have more than one or two proposals in, and each proposal um, we'll have a different lead CI on it and um, different people as collaborators on it. So you can see with all of those um, different institutions here, there's a lot of individual researchers that have been involved in the NAM. We have one, two, three, four, five, six universities, two from industry, um, GA, and one, two, three, four, five from the surveys. And I think that this is increasing because I um, Jeff Fraser told me yesterday that we have another five proposals that have been sent to him um, for the next review session. I want to begin by talking about how the NAM evolved. And it's really important because we've actually used um, um, 
the G8 NAM as a stepping stone to where we are today. So how it started was that Jeff Fraser was um, working on the ICTB Atlas of Australia for Geoscience Australia, and he um, had very little argon data to put into, into their isotopic maps. So he started a Geoscience Australia ANU NAM initiative, and we did, um, we put together 3,600 points on, on their NAM. All of these are from legacy data. And what it showed was that there were some significant gaps across, across Australia where there was no argon data. What it also showed was that a lot of the publications actually had very old data and, and we did include some of these, these data on to the map. However, it, it could be seen that a lot of this data could be done again quite easily. And, and potentially a lot of the questions that were asked many years ago, um, there's new questions that are being asked now for similar areas. And so there was room for new data to be done in a lot of areas where we already had existing data as well. So it became quite apparent that, um, you know, if there was any way that we could increase the argon data across Australia, it would be very worthwhile. So I, and with others' help and input, put a um, proposal into OSCO Opportunity Fund, and it was successful. So now the OSCO NAM initiative has taken on this role of doing the new data. So we have, um, so the NAM's been going for about three years and we have the two distinct stages and they're actually quite different. So Geoscience Australia for the Isotopic Atlas of Australia where we had the legacy data and I will talk a bit more about this at the end. And we now have the Oscope NAM, which is from the 1st of January, 2020, um, um, began with new argon data analyzed specifically for the NAM. And this will end in December, 2000. 2021. Right, if I, I, I want to just go over some of the background of NAM, different types of things that are important and what makes NAM what it is. So to start with, these are some of the major criteria. So the NAM has been developed in collaboration with the National Argon Network involving the laboratories at ANU, Curtin, Melbourne and the University of Queensland. The OSCO provides support for access to infrastructure to allow argon samples to be analysed nationally, providing open and fair data, which is your findability, accessibility, interoperability and reusability. The NAM project has attracted widespread support in the community and is seen of particular significance in providing infrastructure support. And this is really very true. I mean, we have such widespread support um, it's, it's really encouraging. And I think that now it's going to um, increase because um, a lot more people are being exposed to, to this geochronometer. The NAM project closely aligns with and complements and interfaces with OSCOPE data projects, which is the ABRE and the AGN. And we'll talk about that slightly later. And the NAM project, pr project provides funds to allow cases to the infrastructure of the National Argon Network to allow the measurement of 320 samples. Um, this OSCOPE investment has triggered matching in kind in terms of commitment with wide support across the community. And I mean, I might get a bit repetitive here, but um, the, the in kind is actually quite enormous because you can imagine that collecting a sample can be quite expensive, it includes um, transport, you have to go with a group of people. So there's time, transport, accommodation, money, um, all gone into sample collection. Um, if there's drill core, there's all the money associated with drill core. The samples have to be characterised, which is labour and, um, and analysis as well. And um, mineral separation has to be done, which is quite expensive. So there's an enormous amount of in kind, which just um, isn't, you know, you, it's very hard to put on paper, but there's a lot of in kind has gone into getting these samples. So putting the geological value of NAM into two very small sentences, which doesn't do it justice, but um, we propose to deliver a nation scale compilation of argon data and to acquire a significant body of new argon data to address key gaps in the current data set. The outcomes of this proposal will our greatly improved understanding of the crustal history of the Australian continent, 
plus we have a few things offshore, with attendant insights into the origin and preservation of economic resources and to the evolution of the Australian continent. And that's putting it very broadly when you consider if you have a look a bit later about all the um, variation in the proposals that, that have been put in, there's, a, there's lots of um, um, quite different and interesting proposals which um, will provide unusual information. Some of the benefits. Um, so the Oscope NAM project encourages and supports new argon data in areas across Australia where no data has been available, is incomplete, is not to a sufficient standard in areas of geological significance during the evolution of Australia. The new argon geochronology data adds, aims to add information to the measurements of geological time and provide time constraints on differing geological process. And I mean, this will be used in conjunction with other geochronometers as well, for example, uranium lead or rubidium strontium. The new argon geochronology aims at aims to understand in the understanding of the rates and the driving forces for earth processes and the causative relationship between major geological events. So as we increase the data across some of the um, tectonic boundaries, this sort of um, information will um, um, use this sort of data. As the geographic coverage of age data improves, patterns at larger geographical scales will provide insights into the continental scale evolution. So we can add time to reconstructions or time to various events that um, um, have caused major changes and provide a framework to place the results of regional and local scale studies. The continental scale patterns in geological time provides a powerful way to interrogate, interrogate and derive meaning, for example, from continental scale geophysical images and maximising the value of geoscience investment in Earth observations. A bit of a change in direction here. I, I want to talk about these things because they're actually really important and, and they're an important part of the NAM and they're an important part of um, all geochronology um, in, in, in Australia today. So the NAM aims to provide the argon sample age data from key locations across Australia, which provides open and fair data infrastructure to underpin research projects in academia, industry, government, and geological surveys. Some of these things I'll talk about shortly, but um, I'll keep going here. It is key that the NAM age data can allow reuse reusability in the future. Thus, all necessary data must link to each sample information on the laboratory functionality and the method of data interpretation needs to be recorded as well as the isotope data of the mass spectrometer. I mean, once you start looking into the legacy data, this becomes quite apparent that these things are necessary. I mean, I have had people come to my lab and ask for data that was 25 years old. You know, it looked like it was a good data, but all I knew was the name of the person that brought the data to the lab. And, you know, they had so very little information. It was just irretrievable. And so that data was actually lost. I mean, trying to publish a paper 25 years later isn't very good, but, you know, it could have been possible if we'd actually preserved um, and kept all of the necessary data to do that. And the link to OSCO projects, AGN and AVRA, is important to NAM. NAM will have age data from four different argon laboratories and consistency in significant aspects of interoperability will be necessary. This is pres presently being addressed by AGN and NAM. Okay, so I want to talk about you know, what, what argon offers And I, I, I'm continually surprised, you know, when I go to a conference or I go to a meeting at about, people just forget that argon is a geochronometer. They always remember uranium lead and they often remember rubidium strontium and they might remember lutetium hafnium, but they tend to not think that they can actually get information and really important information of argon geochronology. And I'm hoping that this is changing. And so I, I try to um, put out there, as do others, um, the diversity of this geochronometer and what it's useful for. For example, it's very, very versatile 
Um, it can produce age data from diverse geological scenarios with diverse age ranges from um, thousands to um, billions of years from many different potassium bearing minerals, even with very low potassium content. And the minerals that we use aren't accessory minerals. They're actually minerals that can be uh, related to events, whether it's an alteration or um, deformation or what have you. And the age data, and this is one of the other things that came out by doing the GA NAM, was that from all the publications I looked at, any old publication just said everything was a cooling age. You know, there was no doubt everything's a cooling age. There's no alternative. But when you actually have a look at the data, um, there's, a, there's a large variation on what we can actually be dating. We can date you know, crystallization age, we can date growth age, different metamorphic ages, uh, metasomatic ages, we can, we're dating alteration ages. And many of the publications of today um, are showing this variation in, in, in what argon geochronology can actually date, which is um, way more than a lot of other geochronometers can deal with. You know, we're, we're very versatile. And the new technology that's available in the four Australian argon laboratories um, allows really high res resolution, precision and accuracy. All of our labs are decked out with um, new mass spectrometers, you know, best, best um, infrastructure that they can buy to do the, the work that they want to do. And um, I, I particularly just picked out one of the things there, which is the diverse um, geological scenarios that we cater for, because a lot of people, as I've said, just go for igneous bodies or what have you. But, you know, we, we do the basalts and the sea mounts and the lips and the igneous bodies and fluid alteration, metasomatism mineralization alteration, metamorphic rocks of different grades, thermal events, metamorphic tectonites, deformation ductile shear zones, deformation brittle faults, meteorites, detritolite mica, regolith, and I'm sure I've missed out and the other labs could add quite a number of things in there that I missed out. But you get to um, begin to see the picture of just how versatile this geochronometer is and how much it has to offer. And the different labs um, is, is a really a big bonus for Australia because we have um, four labs which actually, um, they're quite diverse. We have the same, we have Thermo Fisher mass spectrometers. We have, the three of us have the same mass spectrometers and the same lasers, but we're set up differently. The labs are actually set up differently because we have a different focus. And um, as, as a consequence that, you know, that, just, that adds diversity to what we can do in our four labs in Australia. We have different expertise, different techniques and a different focus. And um, this is just the, this is the CO2 laser. It's the one from my lab, but it's the same laser that the other labs have as well. And that's my furnace on the right hand side, which I had built at RCS. And that's done for diffusion experiments where we do the temperature time modelling from. The other thing that I wanted to talk about was um, I have people coming and they want to go on a tour of the lab. And I know that other labs do tours as well. And I really encourage that if you're not in argon geochronology, but you'd actually write to the labs and say, you know, I'm visiting the university. Can I come and have a look at your lab? Because the lab tours are really interesting. And if you go along and actually see how the lab functions, you'll get a much better understanding of um, um, how things work and what you can do and why things happen. And it's it's really interesting. And all of us that have a lab, we're really proud of our labs and we love to, love to show people and talk about it. So I'd really encourage that, um, you know, go and have a look, go and have a lab tour in one of the labs and I'm sure that you'll really enjoy it. Right, with the NAM, I'm going to talk about the progress of the NAM and I'm going to talk about the issues that we've had because I feel it's important. and. Um, I, I, I did have milestones with Oscope and um, some of the early milestones just I, I just couldn't meet. However, I'll go through this in a moment and I'll show you the pos positive progress that we're having at the moment. And I'll show you why we couldn't meet um, some of the early ones. To start with, from day one, you'll see this serene picture on the left hand side of trees. That's what I'm looking at when I turn my head and I look out the window, that's what I see. So my house is 20 k's down a dirt road, off the grid, in the bush. And you'll see this fire down here. Our house is in those hills.
So, so it was actually quite hard in January. And um, what happened then was um, there was a lot of smoke, and I know that other capital cities had smoke as well. But Canberra seems to be in some sort of um, um, topography where um, there's fires on all sides, the smoke just went straight down into Canberra, and so ANU actually closed because of the smoke. And so, um, you know, I, I just found it unbelievable that a university would close. However, the university closed. It was only open for what felt like one day, and um, we got hit by a massive mail hailstorm. And for example, Davut's car got smashed to bits, and the labs at ANU got smashed to bits. And um, the areas with the flat roofs, where the mineral set labs were, and our radiation lab, they were closed for quite a long period of time. And this affected us being able to um, get some of the work through on the NAM. It opened up, I think, at about the 7th of March, and one week later, 13th of March, the university shut again. And um, so we were closed again, and we had to start working out how to work from home properly and um, how to, you know, do all the things we normally do in the labs. And um, fortunately, my the, our Argon lab at ANU is um, completely automated, and so Davud was one of the only labs that ANU that was allowed to continue to run. So he did continue to run, but um, just a little bit slower than what we normally do due to various reasons, but we were running. I mean, some of the lockdowns, we have border closures and, and lockdowns across the state. New South Wales survey wasn't allowed to travel. They couldn't go to their core sheds. They couldn't get their rocks. People couldn't get their samples. Victoria survey, you know, they were locked down five days from home. They couldn't go and get their rocks. So there was people getting stressed that um, NAM wasn't getting uh, the material that we needed early on in the year. And now we're having, as a consequence, um, people losing their jobs. And we've had several people lose their jobs um, who are directly related to the NAM. And, and we're really hoping that um, these job losses don't become too severe. Having said all that, We worked our way through that. We we may have missed a few milestones in the beginning, but I would say that NAM is well on track now. And um, the submission and distribution of proposals is widespread across Australia from different institutions and from different geological locations and settings. Some of the proposals that were in, I advise them, you know, they knew what their rocks were. They, they just sat where, where they could and they wrote their proposals with the idea that they wouldn't be able to get their samples till next year. So we have some proposals in where people are still um, getting their samples organised, but that's fine. There's, their proposals are in and um, we have 26 proposals, which represents approximately 300 samples that are now on the NAM website. These proposals are at various stages of progress. We have six proposals that are just getting um, finalised and other proposals that are at different labs um, in the Australian network now. In addition, we already have another five proposals that have been submitted to Jeff, and they're under consideration as well as questions and discussions happening about future proposals. So we still have you know, people um, getting more and more enthusiastic as the time goes by. Right, the presentation of the NAM. Um, Devord, Devord is in charge of um, um, the NAM presentation and he does a really good job. He's very versatile in his skills and he pulls a, a lot of things together. So the National Argon Map is the vis visual presentation of the NAM characterised samples from across Australia that have or will be analysed using the Argon Argon. The map is updated as new samples are located on and 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 as more information becomes available, um, it goes on to the NAM, and there's the EARL for the NAM. The map is the first port of call to NAM, where basic information is accessible via a rollover window for each sample. Necessary links to information will become available as a sample progresses. For example, the geological data, the sample data, age data, and laboratory data. The NAM map will allow findability and accessibility where a user of the NAM will be able to undertake searches, for example, different minerals, 
Um, Jeff, for example, wanted to look up all of the biotide ages of a certain time frame, so that was easily done. Um, you can do searches of different ages. I mean, you just have to think of one of the categories that we've got, and you can you can do that for right across Australia. So how does NEM work? Well, the research proposals are submitted on a NEM template and sent to the overview panel for review. Generally, people will ring up either Jeff or I and have a bit of a chat um, to make sure that they've got the right idea of how to do this, and we can talk about that a little bit later. If the proposal is accepted, the procedure begins, and after a discussion with me, samples will be sent out to the agreed upon um, laboratory for analysis. Discussion regarding mineral separation, which happens quite a lot, um, will happen with the argon laboratory that has been um, designated for the analysis. I mean, each laboratory has its own way of doing things, and, and it's them that has to talk to the client about getting that done. Mineral separation must be organised and funded by the client, but they need to go to the lab to talk about it. Sample description must be submitted via a NAM sample template and sent to me. The templates and information can be found at this URL, and this is just the top of one of the pages. And you'll see that the um, the NAM link here, and it brings up the pages, so you can have um, the map, which is interactive. The oversight panel, you'll get your proposals um, here, and your sample proposal here, and all of the accepted proposals are here. And there's various links in there, which I'll show you some of these in a moment. So if you just um, if you can go to that site or ring up Jeff or I and chat to people about, about it. This, these are the accepted proposals that we have so far. This is um, a bit shorter than what we have on the web, but um, it fitted on the page. So you can see that we have available who submitted them, the general region where they were, and these are linked. So this will take you to the proposal so that you can actually read about what the person is um, aiming on doing. I went through each of those proposals and I took out um, a general title of each of the areas where they're working. And you can see that from these proposals, um, we've really got a, a huge array of places where the people have submitted proposals from. And it's really quite encouraging when you see that list and how diverse the areas are that we're, we're going to be doing this data for. Um, I'll give you an example of one. I just happened that I picked Rafael. So I, all of the examples I show now are his, and he's with the Geological Survey of Western Australia, and this is just an abridged version of his um, research proposal. Th these are really important because um, in here, they need to actually prove to the oversight panel that these samples have importance, that these samples either fill in a gap or they're necessary, uh, as I talked about before, the old data hasn't answered the question or the old data isn't good enough anymore. So they need to prove that the data is um, suitable for NAM. They need to prove they've done their homework about existing literature. What has been dated here? Do we have uranium lead data? Is there, is there old argon data? You know, all of those sorts of things need to come out in this um, um, research proposal so that it can be reviewed properly. And they also need to um, um, explain why the samples, if they have 20 samples, you know, um, are those samples all required or not? And there's been a few proposals where the review committee has increased the number because they thought that it wasn't answering the question. And there's been a few where they've decreased the number of samples, but that's up to the um, oversight panel to decide on. The um, sample description is um, also a template, and um, um, it's quite detailed. They can we can get people to come back and fill in more information if if they haven't done that. But what we do is we ask for really um, information on sample numbers if they've got a unique number, um, detailed information on that long, and all these other sorts of things you can see here. I mean. The surveys are very good at doing all these things on maps. I'm very hopeless, but they're very good. Um, all the information on the dating objective, you have to go into um, what the objective of the dating is, um, sample locations, um, other dating. We really um, want people to submit photographs of the rocks and thin sections if they have them, and all of these sorts of information 
will go into the record and be available. So what happens because they're templates, Devoid is able to um, um, turn these into an Excel sheet. And with this Excel sheet, he's then able to manipulate that data into other software as, as we find necessary. And with that data, for example, one of the things that we do is we produce these rollover windows and we have done these before with the legacy data. However, because the legacy data is from publications and publications don't always give you all the information you need and commonly they don't give you good location sites, but um, there's a lot of information you don't get out of the legacy data. Whereas the, the data and the rollover that we have for the Oscope NAM is really um, thorough. It, we make sure that all the information about the sample is there um, and, um, and available for the future. We can go up scale to look at these things so you can get patterns of this information or you can go down scale. And one of the really um, great things to do is to go right down scale. So just pick a sample and go right down as close as you can. And you can really see like sometimes the samples are in quarries and you can see they're in a certain part of the quarry. I mean, it's really, great to see where all these sam samples come from in in the real you know photograph in in google earth and um the argon map so what we have here is um we can separate out the nam oscope from the geoscience australia oscope the geosciences they're on different layers and so we can just separate them out easily the tiny wee dots are the ga dots and the purple dots are the Oscope dots. Not all of these dots have been put in yet, these locations from the um, Oscope ones. So what I've done is I went through and put a square around. I went through all the proposals and I drew a square from their maps to about um, where I think they were. So this is me drawing square, right? So these squares aren't absolutely perfect. They're just me giving you an idea of where the samples come from. But Every one of these squares has got um, new Oscope argon geochronology coming out in these areas. So you can see really easily how spread out these samples are and how we really are, are filling in the gaps in areas where there is no data and or where we're updating data in some of the older important areas. For example, in New South Wales, they're, um, they're working through so that they can understand the faults and the large scale structures which um, haven't been dated before in the Forbes, the Dubbo and the, 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 the Cobar Basin. And we've got um, a few projects up and down um, the far north Queensland where there was very little to no data at all in East Pine Creek origin and, and so it goes on. And some of the um, some of the things that people are looking at are quite unusual. They're quite doable with Argon, but they're quite unusual. So we have we, we have some quite interesting proposals that are being put forward. Um, all right, I think that I've come to an end. So wh where are we at now? So we continue and complete the argon analysis on samples from the accepted research proposals, obtain all age data and deliver to the project proponent, locate each sample on NAM, Prepare NAM rollers for every sample, noting that information can and will be added in the future um, to suit each, each project. Proposed automated mini report publication with DOIs in consultation with the project proponent. This is something which could easily be automated from the work that the board's done um, with, the, with the templates where all the data will go into a template and then can easily just produce this. And we aim towards um, argon argon analysis being open and fair data. So it's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And finally, we want to thank Oscope for this initiative. I mean, it's just so amazing to me that we have this opportunity to do this. I mean, it's for me, it's very special because obviously argon technology is special to me. It's such an amazing opportunity for our argon community and for the greater geoscience community. And the NAMS received significant number of diverse proposals, which indicates to us that there's a strong level of interest in the application of argon geochronology in the wider geoscience community. And that includes academia, the government surveys, and mineral exploration industry. 
And um, so what do we think this initiative has done? It's lowered the barriers to people using argon geotechnology by providing an opportunity to get access to this technique, expose the benefits and diversity of argon geotechnology to a greater community, given an opportunity to the National Argon Network to function as a community for Australian geosciences and strengthen links with OSCO Geochemistry Network. And we expect that the outcome of this pilot project will produce a significant improvement on the data coverage in key parts of Australia and increase awareness and uptake of the technique for a range of geological applications in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Marnie. That was great. I think the, uh, the example you gave about Jeff looking up the biotite ages, and you can imagine if you have a variety of argon ages on a variety of minerals from one hand sample or, or an outcrop or a region, and you overlay those uh, maps, say age maps on top of each other, the power of that basically being able to pry apart a thermal evolution using this technique in itself is uh, yeah, super powerful. Yes, it's really exciting. <laughs>